Our study today will be found in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. While you are turning there, I want to ask God's blessing specifically on this part of our service. Father in heaven, your word is alive, it's holy, it's powerful. We know we can't handle it. But you have promised through Jesus that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. You have promised that you would be with us, that we would be able to know you are here, and I pray that will be our experience. Please move us close to you, Lord. Teach us and help us to walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Luke 12, 35 through 40. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is a parable. Some of your Bibles will have a subtitle called The Expectant Steward. It's a story that Jesus tells to make a point. He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning like men waiting for their master returning from a wedding. Be ready to open the door immediately. The master will be so impressed that he himself will gird himself, and he will have the servants sit down. He will feed them and serve them. If you know what hour the thief is coming, you watch and don't allow the house to be broken into. Therefore be ready. The Son of Man is coming at an hour unexpected. Now this almost doesn't seem like it goes together. You have references to uh, waste being girded, lamps burning, servants waiting for masters, and then there's just a switch about the house being burglarized. And yet, that house is the point that Jesus is trying to make. As you are aware, in a parable, it is a story, but there's a point to it. There's a main point, and the other stuff feeds into it. The main point of this story is this. If we protect our houses from thieves, we need to protect our souls from thieves. Now, here's our context. We're four, five months before the cross. Jesus is in the geographical region known as Perea, east of the Jordan. He's doing a lot of teaching. Chapter 12, there's a lot of things he is saying. This is a rich, rich section of the Scriptures. Jesus says, beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Beware of coveting. Beware of worrying. Beware of fear. And here he is saying, beware of losing your soul while waiting for the second coming. And for those of you who find this interesting, this is the very first public mention by Jesus about his second coming. He's talking about healthy watching, which is, according to this passage, protecting your soul 
from a thief, protecting our souls. Now, I know down through the years, you have had multiple, multiple conversations, discussions, maybe classes on getting ready. We seldom agree. What does it mean to get ready? Aren't you supposed to be ready? What does that look like? How can it be identified? You may have people winging off on some theological tangent over here, someone winging off on some theological tangent here, someone on some uh, hallelujah rapture diet, and others on something less uh, severe. And how do you get prepared? How do you do that? And today you're going to find out. You're going to discover that Jesus has made the way very clear for each one of us. It's in the first section of this parable. Look at verse 35. Jesus says, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Now, it's important to understand Jesus is dealing with physical things, things that can be seen, things that can be heard in order to apply them to spiritual things. So the physical experience is to help us understand the spiritual experience. And that's key. Because being prepared for Jesus to return is not a physical experience. It is what is happening inside of us spiritually. Loins girded, it says in the King James Version. Dressed and ready for service, it says in the New International Version. Dressed in readiness, New American Standard Bible. Dressed for action, today's English Version. You see, in Jesus' day, the men wore robes. They all wore dresses, as one scholar said. And they were a flowing outer robe that would be in the way. It had to be tucked into a belt in order to travel, to fight, or to work. Now I'm going to show you how that was done. You may wonder how I know. Well, I googled it. I was going to wear a baptismal robe, but I thought that's going a little too far. I didn't have to. A man would reach down, grab the back the back of his robe, and when he pulled it up this way, the front naturally got tucked in. He would pull it to a belt, put it in the belt, pull it up, let the flap down, and it looked like he had a giant pair of diapers on. (laughs) That was how you girded your loins. Now, there should be no one here doubting how to gird your loins. You got it? Don't ask me to demonstrate it again. I thought it was quite adequate. (laughs) Let your waist be girded. Let your loins be girded. What does it mean? Remember that physical activity had a spiritual application. And it's the spiritual application that Jesus wants us to understand. In his day people then would have understood some of these things because that was the world they lived in. It was the environment they grew up in. They would have known this story in Exodus chapter 12. Please turn there. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11. I will read verse 11 and give some explanation. It says, And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Back 1,400 years before Jesus, when Moses went to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, the night that they were delivered was called the Passover. It was an awful night. You had to have blood on the doorposts and on the lintel. If you did not, when that angel, the Passover angel, passed over, 
if there was no blood there, the firstborn in every household that didn't have it died. It was a scary night. It was an awful night. Yet it was a grand night. It was a wonderful night. It was the end of Egyptian captivity. It was the end of slavery. It was the beginning of the journey to the promised land. But the meal they were to eat, they were to eat in haste. They were not to sit and linger and do course after course and just chit-chat and idle the day or the night away. They were to have their loins girded, it says. They were to have their sandals on. They were to have a staff in one hand, eating with the other rapidly. Because the Passover taught them they were passing through. The first thing, spiritually, to be prepared for Jesus to come is to know and remind ourselves this is not our home. We're passing through. We're passing through. The next incidents where we look at uh, girding our loins is found in the book of Job. <clears throat> Job chapter 38. Job, as you know, lost so many things and he became angry at the Lord at one point, basically said, oh, if God would come down here, I've got some questions for him. Watch what happens. This is when God shows up, chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where it says, prepare yourself like a man, Literally in the Hebrew, gird up your loins. Job, gird up your loins. I'm going to question you. Brace yourself. Make yourself as strong and vigorous as possible. Be prepared to put forth the highest effort because I am going to speak to you. That's what God is saying. You see, in the first incidents of girding the loins, it was to, to remind us we're passing through this life. The second incidence is to demonstrate that we are to prepare to hear God when he speaks. It's a choice we make. Preparing to hear God. The third incidence we find in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And beginning with verse 13, <clears throat> excuse me. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Gird up the loins of your mind and pursue holiness. It's a choice. We are passing through. We are to be preparing to hear God. And we are to pursue holiness. These are decisions that we make now, we're going to look at three things that God does to prepare us for his return. Let's go back to Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Right now, probably most of us in here are confused about something. Here's the confusion. We know this parable is about the second coming. We know this parable is about being ready. We know this parable is about preparation. There was a wedding mentioned in this parable. And there's a lamp mentioned in this parable. So naturally, our minds run to another parable in Matthew 25, 
It's about ten virgins who are waiting for the bridegroom to come. These ten virgins fall asleep while they're waiting. When the announcement comes the bridegroom is here, they jump up and they light their lamps. Five of them have oil or enough oil, and they go out and join the group. Five of them don't have oil. They have to run to try to buy some somewhere, and they're locked out. Take that parable and leave it in Matthew 25. It has absolutely nothing to do with this parable. But that's where our confusion is. Notice in this parable, the master went to a wedding, right? It's just Jesus saying he was at a happy enough occasion. The servants didn't know when he would come back. And he came back at a late hour. It is not the wedding that we call the second coming. You also don't have bridesmaids representing people who are ready or not. You have a, a message about lamps. These are not torches. These are not the types of lamps that the ten virgins had. This is the work of God in the soul of an individual. Let me show you what the Bible says about this. I'd like you to look at Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27. Here we go. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the inner depths of his heart. Now this strange saying is actually demonstrating that the lamp being referred to is God himself seeking and searching through the conscience of an individual. It is God putting light on the person so they know who they are, what they are, how they compare to God, what their needs are, and it causes, if properly received, causes repentance and causes a call for Jesus to be Savior. So the first three things we looked at, we choose. We choose to remind ourselves we're passing through. We choose to prepare to hear God. We choose to pursue holiness. Lamps burning is the work of God upon the conscience. It is God searching the conscience. We look at Proverbs 20, verse 20. Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. What does that mean? It was such a heinous sin in the eyes of God that to curse mother or father would put yourself in danger of a relationship with God due to the sin. And you have this concept here where we're being taught that whoever does that, watch out. If they don't repent, if they, if they don't stop it, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. That means the conscience will no longer receive the light of God. They will be snuffed out, if you will, spiritually. This is the work of God on the conscience. One more verse. Proverbs 13, verse 9. Proverbs 13, verse 9 says, The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Now, we're not going to focus on the putting out of the lamp of the wicked. We're going to focus on what happens to the righteous. It says the light of the righteous rejoices. Hebrew scholars say that's a mixed metaphor. It means it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. However, as it gets brighter, it does rejoice because it's in the presence of God. And in the presence of God, there is the fullness of joy. So what we have here, we have a picture 
where Jesus is saying, here is how you keep your soul from being stolen. Here is how you prepare to meet Jesus in peace when he comes. You remember and remind yourself you're just passing through. You prepare to hear God. You pursue holiness, and God will be searching, snuffing, and shining into your heart. Be ready, get ready. It's a matter of protecting our soul. Does this make sense? Everything else will fall into its place when we focus on having our loins girded and the lamps lit. So I'm wondering today if there's anyone here who would like to say, Lord, I want you to move so strongly in my life that I'll remember I'm just passing through and I will prepare and will hear you and I will pursue and seek holiness. And Lord, I pray that you will search my heart. And I pray that you would shine brighter and brighter and brighter until that perfect day. If you want to say that to the Lord, I invite you to stand. Father in heaven, what can we say but thank you? Thank you for telling us how to keep the thief from stealing our soul. By your grace, may we walk with you in a way that it does not happen to us, our family members, our loved ones, or our friends. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.